Hello, welcome to our overview of some of the major movements in the 18th century in Europe and America. As we saw with our look at Rococo, the 18th century saw the arrival of art that catered to the wealthy and powerful. This reflects the wider developments occurring in Europe, where the small populations of nobles controlled the majority of the land and wealth. This proved to be an unsustainable system, and by the end of the 18th century, we saw major revolutions take place in the British colonies in America and in the Kingdom of France, where populations rose up in resistance against the monarchies. This political unrest greatly influenced artists throughout the 18th century. They used their artistry to support the political causes they sided with and communicated messages about their respective ideals. What's more, the 18th century is also known as the Enlightenment, a time when logic and reason was being invoked to reform social dynamics, political governments, and economic norms. Side by side, advancements in science, social science, and political theory helped pave the way for a reevaluation of the inherited beliefs of previous generations. We will begin by looking at two works from English painters where the ideas of the Enlightenment were frequent subjects in art. Hogarth was one of the greatest artists who worked in satire in the 18th century. He made a series of paintings and prints that took viewers on a narrative journey in stages, following the episodes of aristocratic individuals adhering to the outdated norms of society. His series called Marriage a la Mode details the arranged marriage of two young aristocrats, supposedly set up by their families to ensure their continued wealth and status. In this painting, called The Marriage Settlement, we see the negotiation between the two families and their representatives taking place, with little participation and input on the part of the potential bride and groom. The young couple is seated to the left, literally and figuratively on the sidelines, as older men determine their fate. They are well-dressed, but show no interest in each other or in their surroundings. One man leans down to whisper something in the ear of the intended young bride, but she seems to only be able to listen and not respond or contribute. And four men gather around at a table in the center, supposedly deliberating over the values, wealth, and family lineage of the couple in question. Like the Rococo paintings, Hogarth's painting offers viewers an abundance of visual clues to interpret this scene. The man at the far right, presumably the father of the intended groom, produces his family tree. Crutches flank him and rest on the chair, and his foot is propped, likely suffering from gout. At the far left, two dogs sit aimlessly, chained to each other, probably symbolizing the fate awaiting the young couple. The paintings on the walls demonstrate the wealth and status of the young man, but Hogarth has included a strange painting of a Medusa head. Her mouth gaped open as if in horror at the business approach to romantic partnership. Hogarth offers us this scene in order to criticize these types of transactions, where individuals are more concerned about the status quo than allowing the freedom of choice and the young individuals to exercise their own free will, concepts being supported by many Enlightenment thinkers at the time. Another take on the Enlightenment is offered by the British artist Joseph Wright of Derby, who celebrated the scientific discoveries and the spread of scientific knowledge throughout the country. Wright depicts a philosopher in the center, identified by his bright red cloak presenting information on the solar system, shown through the model below. An orrery was a miniature replica of the solar system that demonstrated how the planets orbited around the sun. And these types of mechanisms were brought from town to town with traveling scientists and philosophers, sharing the knowledge gained by scholars in recent decades with the average citizens. Wright's use of light and shadow echoes the drama of the broke tenebrism. However, 
The Baroque scenes use tenebrism to dramatize the religious narratives. And here, Wright uses it to illustrate how individuals are being brought into the light with knowledge of the natural world rather than dependence on religious beliefs and institutions. Everyone seems transfixed by the orrery, and the viewer is left imagining what these individuals will do next with their newfound knowledge. In terms of artistic style, one of the most recognizable movements of the mid to late 18th century in European and American art is neoclassicism. As its name suggests, neoclassicism is characterized by a renewed interest in the classical styles and ideals of ancient Greece and Rome. As intellectuals were calling for an improvement in the distribution of political power and economic wealth during the Enlightenment, Artists illustrated similar calls by depicting scenes that emphasize morality and ethics, civic duty, and participation in government. These works often utilized highly realistic technical approaches, continuing the practices since the Renaissance of accuracy and precision in perspective, scale, and coloring. One of the major results of Enlightenment political theories was the American Revolution, the war for independence fought by the British colonies against their motherland in the 1770s and 1780s. Many individuals read and wrote extensively about the need for a new contract between men and their government, calling for a more representative system and proclaiming the formation of a new collective identity in the colonies that was unlike anywhere else, including Britain. One such individual was Paul Revere, a pewter smith from Boston, descended from early colonial Puritans who settled in Boston in the early 17th century. Revere could easily maintain a distinct American identity considering the length of time his family had lived on the American continent. The artist John Singleton Copley emphasizes the unique characteristics of the enlightened craftsman in America with his portrait of Revere, someone who was incredibly skilled at his profession, but also interested in more intellectual matters. Revere holds a teapot ready for engraving in one hand, but places the other hand under his chin a symbol of intellectual activity since the time of ancient Greece. Though more finely dressed than necessary for this type of work, Revere is shown in a comfortable pose and a casual appearance, his collar loosened to signify that elegant clothes need not make the man. Revere holds the viewer's gaze intently, showing an unwavering spirit that would be necessary to resist the powerful colonizers he and his fellow rebels fought and beat in the American Revolution. Arguably the most important figure of the American Revolution was George Washington, immortalized in marble here by the French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin. Unlike the royal portraits painted to celebrate the absolute monarchs nearly a century before, this statue was commissioned by the legislature of Virginia, the representative governing body of the new state. Asked to help find the perfect artist for the task, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, two men who had been pivotal in the formation of the American Revolution and the creation of the newly independent United States of America, were serving as ambassadors to France at the time. They selected Oudon, and sent him to Virginia to create an accurate likeness of the first president of the United States. Exhibiting a slight contrapposto stance, Washington clearly reminds us of the sculptures from ancient Greece, the birthplace of democracy and representative government. Unlike portraits of monarchs, Washington rests his proper right hand on a simple walking stick instead of a scepter and rests his proper left hand on his army jacket, now hung up, unused, atop a bundle of 13 rods representing the 13 colonies who then became the 13 states. 
As with most neoclassical works, especially in America, Oudin's sculpture borrows recognizable elements from classical artistic traditions in order to communicate meanings for a contemporary subject matter and a contemporary audience. Less overtly contemporary are the references made in the neoclassical paintings of Jacques-Louis Davy, who worked in France just before, during, and immediately after the French Revolution of the 1790s. Davy made monumental paintings meant for exhibition at the Salons and Academies of Paris, where history painting reigned supreme. Davy gives us a classical scene here, depicting a climactic moment in the story of the Horatii brothers, who swear an oath to their father to protect Rome from foreign threats, even when one of those they will fight is married to a female family member, mourning at the right. The men display determined energy here, with strong diagonal lines created by the legs, arms, and swords of all three brothers and their father. In complete contrast, the women sag and slump downwards, pulled heavily by their grief at the death that will soon come from such fighting. David uses intensely accurate details in scale, proportion, and perspective, using the Roman architectural feats of the column and the arch to frame the figures in what looks like a realistic three-dimensional space. By making the scene appear so real to viewers, the emotional intensity and moral purpose of the painting also feels very immediate and real, as if this moment were happening right now in front of us. Self-sacrifice and the protection of your nation, your community, and your family honor is most important, but you must be aware of the suffering that will occur in order to accomplish the greater good. Moving away from France for a moment, we can look at how artists like Angelica Kaufman made use of the thematic and stylistic characteristics of neoclassicism to instruct her viewer on morals as well. Kaufman was an accomplished artist, the only child of an artist father who devoted his life to her artistic training when her mother died young. Traveling from their native Switzerland to Vienna and Rome, and ultimately to London, Kaufmann learned from up-close observation of the best painters in Europe and the ruins of the ancient Roman civilization. Here she references the lessons of ancient Roman Republic, when government was administered through shared powers among both emperors and senators. Cornelia stands in the center, elegantly dressed and dignified in her tall stature. When asked by the seated woman in the beautiful red drapery whether she can boast treasures as fine as the gold necklace and other jewels she carries, Cornelia gestures to her children, suggesting that her progeny is the most precious thing in the world. Defining her role as a mother, we are reminded of the virtues women can aspire to uphold. Her young sons to the left will one day grow up to be Roman statesmen themselves, known for introducing important reforms to improve their government. Although she is not asking viewers to sacrifice themselves for the good of their communities, as David seems to be saying, Kaufmann is clearly suggesting that viewers should be more concerned with the examples they set as nurturers of character rather than concerned with material goods. A similar lesson was suggested by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun, the court painter to Queen Marie Antoinette, wife of King Louis XVI in France. Unfortunately, this lesson was spelled out too late for the redemption of the queen in the public's eye. Marie Antoinette was known for extravagance, Married to Louis XVI at a very young age of 14, she threw lavish parties and delighted in dresses, jewelry, and unbelievable hairstyles as a young woman presiding over the court at Versailles. 
For years she had failed to produce an heir, threatening the livelihood of the dynasty of the French monarchy. Sensational rumors abounded, and when citizens in France began to suffer from seasons of poor harvests and famine, word of her extravagance enraged her subjects. In an attempt to revise her public image, her faithful portrait artist produced this work, a portrait of the queen with her children. Here, Vijay Lebrun focuses on Marie Antoinette's successful role as queen, bearing offspring for the king of France and appearing as a caring mother. The heir to the throne, Louis XVII, stands at the right, gesturing towards the empty bassinet to remind viewers of the baby Marie Antoinette lost, evoking our sympathies and reminding us that she too has suffered. The richness of Versailles is tempered here. Yes, there are still elegant rugs and furnishings fit for the royal family, but the gold and opulence of the palace is nowhere to be seen. The precise perspective, proportion, and arrangement of figures here appears quiet and calm, demonstrating her silent dignity befitting a monarch and a mother. Unfortunately for Marie Antoinette, the French citizens marched on Versailles and captured the royal family. After years of protest and unrest, with many attempts at legislative reform, both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were put on trial by the newly appointed French governments and executed by the people of France. The monarchs wouldn't be the only ones who lost their lives in the chaos of the French Revolution. David agreed with the revolutionaries who wanted to overthrow the monarchy and establish representative government in France. He even joined some of the most radical wings of the French Revolution and used his art to document and communicate specific events and their meanings. Unlike the American Revolution, which was predominantly fought by warring militaries and militias, the French Revolution was fought in the streets among citizens as much of the French army remained at the borders of France, fending off threats from outside kingdoms. The French Revolution was known for riots in the streets and chaotic clashes, where dozens and hundreds of people could be summarily killed or executed for seemingly minor offenses, an attempt by one faction to seize control from another. The figure of Marat, painted here, was known for his incendiary writings that were thought to have provoked much of the violence in the streets, including a particularly bloody riot and massacre in 1792. For his role in this massacre, a woman named Charlotte Corday murdered him, deceiving the men at the entrance to his residence to let her enter with news that he could use. Since Marat had a skin condition that kept him confined to the bathtub, where he did most of his writing. He was completely helpless when she attacked him with a knife and stabbed him to death. Davi gives us the moment when Marat is dying from his stab wounds, slumped over to one side and bleeding into a bright red bath in stark contrast to the white sheets surrounding him and the paleness of his skin. He holds in one hand the note that Corday bore to gain entry, and David places the name of his attacker legibly on the paper. And in the other hand, he still holds the quill, supposedly his only weapon. David uses the stark tenebrism to concentrate our attention on Marat, also signaling the somberness of the moment. Davi uses these techniques of realism to make this moment seem so close to us, when in reality it probably didn't look much like this at all. Marat seems too peaceful, almost martyr-like, recalling the religious paintings and saints and martyrs from earlier eras. This is the new martyr, David is saying, the one who would be killed for a righteous cause. Unfortunately, it would be several more decades before the people of France finally would be free from the tyranny of the monarchy and other authoritarian regimes. 
This concludes our brief overview of the Enlightenment and neoclassicism in the art of the 18th century.